All right, you should be able to see your screen now, my screen, I mean. Um, if I get too quiet, let me know, and I'll try and speak up. I'm not feeling real well. I'm a bit dizzy, and I think it's because of uh, the shingles vaccine. All right, today is November 7th. And we are supposed to be covering chapter uh, six and finishing it and beginning chapter eight. I'm not sure we're going to get that far, but we'll see what we do. There is a lab today, lab eight. Any questions about any of that? Let me, let me remind you that on the schedule I built in uh, no class for Thursday because of Veterans Day. Veterans Day is actually not on Thursday. It's Friday, but uh, uh, I decided to give it off, the day off. Um, I'm not sure if I'm required to do that or not, but uh, I did. Any questions about any of that? Let me state that your unknown work, you should be working on your unknown project, and your infectious disease paper is due Saturday, November 11th. That is this Saturday. Uh, before you write up the uh, infectious disease paper, make sure you check with me to make sure the topic is one that nobody else has taken and that it's an a valid topic, meaning that it's actually an infectious disease. Any questions about any of that? All right, let's move to uh, chapter six then. Oh, let me mention I did do some grading. I do not think I got the current lab graded uh, because I was very dizzy this weekend, but uh, I will try and get that done shortly. I'm still a little dizzy, but uh, Sunday night I was so dizzy I had to hold on to things for fear of falling. All right, last time we talked about the chemical requirements, the organic growth factors, and some examples of them. Uh, living things also have a chemical requirement. Did we talk about this? Oxygen. Molecular oxygen is, in a sense, a uh, toxic substance. Did we talk yeah, about Yeah, I, I believe so. It was... We thought so, too. Yeah, I think we're a little bit further. Let's we got to here. a little past hydroxyl radical, maybe? Yeah, I think we may have stopped on this slide. I think I discussed um, the different, well, let me blow this slide up. The different effects of oxygen on the growth of various types of bacteria, meaning I think I talked about obligate aerobes and facultative anaerobes. Did I not? Yeah, I think you went over, you did go over these. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, let me just check, make sure there's not an, another two here. Well, I'm not there, am I? I don't think I got this far, did I? I don't remember discussing. No, yeah, no right. I don't think so. <clears throat> Let me remove that. I usually try to remove these from... Uh, 
Alas. All right. So there are different culture medias. Uh, culture medium is what you use when you're talking about one medium. When you're talking about two or more, we use the word media because that's the plural of medium. It is a liquid or solid solution containing all the nutrients needed for microbial growth. Uh, when we give you a culture media in the lab, it would be sterile, meaning it has no living microbes in it. And how we do that is we put the culture media in an autoclave, and that kills all living organisms, including endospores. An inoculum is the microbes that are introduced into the medium. A culture is the microbes growing in or on a culture medium. There are a wide variety of media available in microbiology to grow cultures. If you were to come into the lab, I would hold up a book, which is almost this big. It's actually a little bigger and a little longer. And it's about this thick. It might even be a little thicker. And you can see this is a really big, it's not a book, but if it was a book, it'd be a really big book. On each page of that book, there is a different media. And then it lists all the ingredients of the media and then a few things about the media. Uh, so each page with a book this thick is a lot of different types of media that we have available in microbiology for growing our cultures. Any question about any of that? The purpose of the media is to support the microbial growth. A medium must provide an energy source, a carbon source, a source of nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, trace elements, and organic growth factors if the organism requires them. Now, if we're growing a photosynthetic organism that is an um, autotroph, what do we need to supply? This is a photosynthetic organism and we allow it to grow in light. And it's an autotroph. So does it need an energy source? That's a yes or no. Yes. Uh, well, it does, but we're giving it light, so we don't need to supply it. Okay? So we don't need to supply an energy source because it's using light. Does it need a carbon source? Well, do we need to supply a carbon source? Let me word it that way. Nobody's going to get back. Yes. Uh, no, it doesn't. It's an autotroph, so it will get its carbon from CO2 in the air or the media, dissolved in the media. So we don't need to supply a carbon source. We do need to supply a source of nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, and trace elements, because all living things need that. The only exception would be if it was an organism that could fix nitrogen from the air, then we wouldn't need to supply the nitrogen source. But most microbes do need a nitrogen source. Most microbes do not need to be given a trace elements because the ingredients of the media, as well as the water, if we're using tap water, will supply the trace elements. The only exception would be if you're making the media by adding chemicals yourself, like I sometimes made glucose and sodium chloride and a few um, 
like magnesium chloride, maybe uh, magnesium sulfate also. And that, that, that media was called glucose sulfate media. And if I made it out of distilled water, I would need to supply some trace elements. But if I use tap water to make uh, the glucose salts media, I wouldn't need to supply trace elements. It's because trace elements come from tap water as well as, um, well, like ground up beef or ground up uh, soybeans, if that's in the media. You get the trace elements that way. So only if you're adding the exact chemicals and distilled water would you need to add the trace elements. Organic growth factors, most microbes do not need organic growth factors. However, there are some that do, like Streptococcus pyogenes, will not grow unless you supply the organic growth factors that it needs. And how we do that is we add uh, red blood cells, generally from sheep, to the median. We call that blood auger. And the blood supplies the organic growth factors that Streptococcus pyogenes needs to grow. And so we don't need to do anything but supply the blood. Any question about any of that? All right. Agar is a complex polysaccharide derived from seaweed. It's used as a solidifying agent for culture media, con converting a liquid media into a solid media. Usually, when we're growing solid media, we grow it in a uh, petri dish or in a tube. And we can grow it in a tube in a slant or in a deep. Let me show you what I mean by that. So a deep is a tube like this, and the auger just goes across straight. A slant is a tube like this, Obviously a better tube than that, but it's good enough. Where the auger goes like that in a slant. And then you uh, inoculate the slant here. And the deep, you just inoculate this way if you're only growing it on the top. Any question about that? Now, a liquid media is usually grown in a tube because in a plate, it just spills out pretty easily. Although you could grow it in a plate as long as you're careful about making sure you don't spill it out of the out of the edges of the plate. Auger is generally not metabolized by microbes. A Louis Pasteur, not Louis Pasteur, um, sorry, I'm getting a brank here, Dr. Koch, initially started growing microbes on a solid media because it was easier than growing it on a liquid media. And then you could get colonies on a solid media. And in a liquid media, you can't get colonies. He initially was growing it on cuts of a potato. And I don't know if it's a cooked potato or a raw potato. And as you can imagine, that's not the best thing to grow microbes on. He then converted to growing it on uh, sorry, having a hard time here, gelatin, jello in a solid media. The trouble with jello was some microbes dissolve the jello and then the solid surface becomes a liquid and then as isolated colonies then mix together and he didn't want that so it was actually a wife of one of his uh, assistants who suggested he try auger auger is something used in baking and in cooking to thicken i don't know food and uh, 
he did. He found that microbes don't digest it. And it was such a good agent to use that he used it widely. And we still use it widely today. It is the most common solidifying agent used in microbiology. There are a few other agents that can be used. Jello is still used. And uh, starch is the other main one. And both microbes do digest both starch and, and gelatin. So there are different types of uh, media. There are chemically defined media, and these media have the exact chemical composition of the media known because it has all of the molecules that you add when you make the uh, media. Let me blow this up. Oh, let me move that down here. So this looks like it's glucose salts media. All it has is glucose, ammonium, ammonium phosphate, sodium chloride, magnesium sulfate, potassium phosphate, and water. So all of the molecules in this media are either glucose or one of these ingredients. Um, ammonium phosphate supplies nitrogen and then phosphate source. Sodium chloride provides sodium and chloride. Uh, magnesium sulfate provides magnesium and then sulfate. And then potassium phosphate gives uh, potassium and then more phosphate, so phosphorus. And then water, of course, which if it's using distilled water, all it is is H2O. So this media does not supply, if you're using distilled water, does not supply trace elements. And no other molecules are in this media. It is usually used only for growing uh, autotrophs because they're not very picky about what their media is. Uh, you can grow E. coli in this, um, but there's many bacteria that will not grow in it, and I can't think of any off the top of my head except for, obviously, Streptococcus pyogenes, although I should be able to state some. I think Micrococcus luteus cannot grow in this, but I have to look it up to be certain about that. Um, and any fastidious organism would not grow in this because a fastidious organism has a number of requirements that need to be added. And this media, which you can barely see, let me go back, is one they make for a fastidious organism, and it's giving <clears throat> carbon and energy sources, glucose, starch, sodium azide or something like that, sodium citrate, oxaloacetate, a bunch of salts, I can't read them, potassium phosphate, sodium chloride, sodium bicarbonate, potassium sulfate, etc. And then a bunch of uh, amino acids, cysteine, arginine, glutamic acid, asparagine, cytosine, organic growth factors, reducing agents, uh, biotin and uracil, I think those are B vitamins. So this would be a media that a fastidious organism might grow in. I don't know if Streptococcus, Streptococcus pyogenes would grow in this because I don't know what exactly it requires from blood. Uh, uracil might be one of the things, but I don't remember what Streptococcus pyogenes means. <clears throat> um, like I said, chemically defined media are usually used for growing autotrophs because they're not very picky and they're easier to grow. 
most of the microbes that we grow, we grow in a complex media where we do not know the exact chemical composition of the media. It contains extracts and digestive yeasts, meats, and or plants, and these provide vitamins and organic growth factors. And then the exact chemical composition is not known. For example, let me blow this up. Nutrient auger, shown here, contains peptone. That's a partially digested protein uh, mixture derived from uh, soybeans, beef extract, sodium chloride, auger, and water. If we're using distilled water, that would be fine because the beef extract and the peptone will supply the trace elements. The beef extract will also contain all of the molecules that were in the cow before it was ground up. And that would vary from cow to cow, depending on what the cows were eating. Any question about any of that? Complex media are used to grow, used to grow heterotrophs, bacteria and fungi, which require an organic carbon source. And that's because they supply what they need, like E. coli can grow on this and uh, Micrococcus luteus, Streptococcus epidermidis. Any question about any of that? Now, a fastidious organism would not grow in nutrient auger because it has to have specific additives added for the fastidious organism to grow. And like I said, the, the only one I can think of, actually, I can think of another one, Haemophilus influenzae and Streptococcus pyogenes would not grow in this because they're fastidious. You can get them to grow on chocolate auger or blood auger because that supplies the nutrients in the blood that uh, supply what the organism needs, the fastidious organism needs. Now, I should mention that um, Haemophilus influenzae will not grow on blood auger, but Streptococcus pyogenes will. And Haemophilus influenzae will not grow on blood auger because it cannot lyse the red blood cells. And if it doesn't lyse the red blood cell, it doesn't get the nutrients from the blood. Tryptococcus pyogenes can lyse the red blood cells, and it gets the nutrients it needs from the blood, the lyse blood. All right, there are different types of culture media. There's also anaerobic media, and these are important for growing obligate anaerobes. anaerobes. These organisms must avoid exposure to oxygen. Inside the media, there is a reducing agent, such as sodium thioglycolate, that combines with and removes oxygen from the media, resulting in oxygen depletion, at least at the bottom of a sodium thioglycolate tube. The media is heated before use, usually in the autoclave, to drive off the absorbed oxygen. And then if you recap it immediately after you get it out of the autoclave, the media would have very little oxygen. And what little is there will be reduced by the sodium thioglycolate and pulled out of the media. If you leave the cap open, oxygen will keep moving into the tube, and so the very top of the tube would be normal oxygen, the same as the, the air, but as you go down the tube, you'll get less and less oxygen, and at the bottom of the tube, there'd be no oxygen. Any question about any of that? There's also selective media, and this media halts or inhibits the growth of a particular group of microorganisms while not affecting the growth of another group 
of microorganisms. An example of a selective media is one containing 7% sodium chloride. Most microbes will not grow above about 2% sodium chloride. So it, we try to grow it in 7% sodium chloride only the microbes that tolerate salt, 7% specifically, would grow on the plate, and most other microbes would not grow. They would be selected against. <clears throat> any question about any of that? There's also differential media. This media provides differences between two different types of cells or organisms. And the difference is not related to how well the organism grows on the media. Usually, the difference is something you can see, like a different color or a different pattern of bacterial growth, making it easy to distinguish colonies of different microbes. An example of a differential media is blood auger. With blood auger, you can distinguish between different types of hemolysis. There's gamma hemolysis, shown here, where the blood is red all the way up to the, the Greek gamma, which is a sort of a white or off-white color. I'm going to blow this up. So there's no hemolysis, and this we call gamma hemolysis, or no hemolysis. There's also alpha hemolysis, shown here, where there's a dark darkening of the media between the red here and then the darkening of the media before we reach the, I guess, off-white of the alpha, which is where the bacteria is growing. The Partial hemolysis or alpha hemolysis is best shown in the alpha right there, where it's darker than the red here. And that darkening is what we usually see, either a darkening of the blood or a uh, greenish tint to the blood, which is partial hemolysis, where some of the red blood cells are lysed, but not all of them, giving it either a greenish tint or a darker tint. Any question about that? Beta hemolysis, also known as complete hemolysis, is where all of the red blood cells lice. And that results in the complete hemolysis, which is shown by the clear region right here. It's actually not white. Come on, mouse. My mouse isn't working over the plate. There it is. Uh, for some reason, it's working there, but not over here. Anyways, uh, this is actually clear. The white there is where our bacteria is growing in the beta. And then this here is the clear region, which is complete hemolysis, where all of the red blood cells have been lysed. So normally, there's the red blood cells. And there, you see a darkening, which is normally what you see. You find a ring of alpha hemolysis around a beta hemolysis. And then the beta is the clear region. If you were to hold this plate up to the light, you can see through the region where there's complete hemolysis. Like I could hold it up to the clock and see what time it is through the plate, through that region of the plate. Any question about any of that? All right, there's also selective and differential media. This is a media which is both selective and differential. An example of a selective and differential media is eosine methylene blue plates, also called EMB plates. It is selective against gram-positive bacteria and differential on the basis of lactose fermentation. So gram-positive bacteria do not grow or do not grow well on the EMB plates. They're selected against. 
So if we get good growth, or maybe just growth, it's gram negative, and it's differential. If it can ferment the sugar lactose, it'll be either this greenish tint here or blackish. If you look right there, let me blow this up a little more. You can see that that colony is blackish. And that's sort of a metallic greenish tint, tint color there. And uh, that is because of the fermentation of lactose creating an acid, making it look blackish or uh, green, metallic green. Uh, let's shrink that down now. If the bacteria does not ferment lactose and it's gram negative, so it will grow on the EMB plate, it will not be blackish or greenish in color. And here you can see the bacteria is its normal color, which is fairly white. Any question about any of that? There's one other media I need to talk about, and it's an enrichment media. This media encourages the growth of certain types of bacteria, but selects against other bacteria. So in a sense, it is a selective media, but we don't use it the same way. We use an enrichment media to increase the numbers of a desired microbe to bring it to detectable levels. This is particularly useful if we're looking for an organism that is very rare in the specimen. And that could be like a bacteria in the soil where there's thousands or maybe even more than that of bacteria in the soil and we're looking for a rare one. Or when we're looking for in a clinical specimen, maybe for a pathogen, like from the uh, fecal smear, and we suspect the pathogen is at low number compared to uh, the normal bacteria in the fecal smear, meaning the normal microbiota in the intestines. So what we can do is uh, grow that bacteria in an enrichment media, and that will encourage the growth of the category of cells we want. And if we can increase their number to a detectable level, we can then streak it out and have a chance of finding the cells of interest. Any question about any of that? So an example of using enrichment media is let's say we're trying to find a phenol degrading bacteria in the soil and there are thousands of other bacteria. So let's say there's one in 100,000 bacteria in the soil that is uh, capable of phenol degrading. If we were to streak that out, we would have to streak out 100,000 colonies before we would have the hope of finding one that was actually phenol degrading. And what we can do is putting in an enrichment medium. One possibility is make phenol the only carbon source in the media. Now phenol degrading bacteria will grow in this media and other bacteria would be selected against. Let me show you. Sorry, I'm feeling a little dizzy, and so I'm a little slower. So this is our selective media. And we inoculate the first one with bacteria from the soil. And I said something like... Uh, one out of 100,000. Well, if this enriches 100 fold, we would still only have 
Uh, what is it? One in a thousand, is that right? Which, if we were to streak out 10 colonies, there's no hope of finding it. But if we get this to grow again, oops, let me go back. And get it out of that one so it's enriched here and then enriched here. And if it enriches one in a hundred times again, so it enriches, uh, we'll just say a hundred times. Then that would mean that uh, one out of 10 cells that we were to test from here would uh, be a phenol degrading bacteria. And if we streaked out 10 colonies on a plate and we sampled all 10 of them, we'd actually likely find one that would be phenol degrading. So at this point, we've enriched enough, although you could go further if you really wanted to go further. And come on. This wouldn't enrich a hundred times here, but let's say it enriches so oh, five times, and then you would get it uh, something like uh, one out of two colonies would be phenol degrading. Anyways, that's how you use the uh, enrichment media. Any questions about any of that? All right, this table is going through the review of the different types of media, chemically defined media, a complex media, a reducing media, a selective media, a differential media, and an enrichment media. Remember that some media are combinations of these different types like we have a number of selective and differential media. And then uh, blood auger is a com uh, complex and a uh, oh, what is that called? Not an enrichment media, but an enriched media which isn't, we haven't talked about that. An enriched media is one you use to grow a fastidious organism in. Oh, and uh, blood auger is also a differential media. All right, so uh, how do we obtain pure cultures? A pure culture is one culture that contains only one species. It was actually Louis Pasteur who came up with the idea uh, using a pure culture to study it. And then uh, he came up with the method of deriving the pure culture. And what he did was he did a bunch of serial dilutions and then made multiple copies of these dilutions. And if ever he found a dilution where only one tube had growth in it, he correctly assumed that that one tube with growth is likely to be derived from one or a few cells so that it's likely to be a pure culture. That was actually a very difficult way of obtaining a pure culture. And uh, Dr. Koch came up with a much easier way of obtaining a pure culture. And what he did was he streaked out colonies on a solid media, and then we'd take cells from one isolated colony and then streak it out again on a second plate to get isolated colonies. And uh, the cells that have gone through two colony formation events would be likely to be a, do you mind if I get this? This might be 
something important here. Hello. All right. Uh, sorry about that. Um, a peer culture contains only one species, and if you take cells that have gone through two colony formation events, you're likely to get a peer culture. Over 95% of the colonies that uh, have gone through two colony streaking events will be pure, meaning a pure culture. A colony is a population of cells arising from a single cell or a, a small number of cells, like two or a clump of cells, forming a colony because they're spaced out, meaning we look for an isolated colony. And therefore, when we count the colonies on a plate, we will usually use the term colony forming unit rather than the number of cells that form the colonies on a plate. To obtain single colonies is a critical part of obtaining a pure culture. And let's look at how we make a streak plate mate method, meaning streaking for colony isolation. You take from your stock culture a bunch of cells, and then you streak it into quadrants, or in this case, three sectors. And what you do is you take from the stock, and then you move down the plate, only doing one sector. At the very beginning, let me blow this up. At the very beginning, you'll have very um, dense cells that you're putting on. And as you streak further, they'll be getting less dense, but still fairly dense, as seen here, but it's not quite as dense here. And then you make sector two, where you sterilize the loop. And then you start streaking in sector two, and you don't streak all the way back to where sector one is very heavy. Usually you streak into sector two only about three times. I don't know why they're doing it so many times, but that's the way they're doing it. They're doing it one, come on mouse, one, two, three, four, five times. Normally you'd only do it three times. And normally you only go where it's the lightest in sector one. So you'd only go to about here. You wouldn't quite go to there. And then you streak out sector two. Now the loop is sterilized, so right here, we shouldn't have any cells. And I don't know why we're seeing cells there, but here it's a little different. Maybe they did streak it here and they just didn't go there. And there's nothing there. And then we see sector two. And as you can see, we're starting to get isolated colonies in sector two. And then you sterilize your loop again. And then you, actually you should start it in sector three and then move into sector two, going into sector two where the bacteria are lower in concentration, meaning you don't wanna go in this region here, come on, this region here. You only wanna go where in this region here where the bacteria are reduced in number. And you shouldn't do it only one time as shown here. You should start in sector three and then go into sector two, uh, two or three times, at least three times. And what you're doing is you're picking up cells when you go into sector two, and then you streak in sector three. What you should do is streak in each sector at least 20 times. They're a little bit shy here but they wanted to make it so you could see it. And they're a little shy there and a little shy there too. Like I said, it's okay to cross over again, but you wanna streak in 20 or 30 times to make sure you put down someplace on this plate, isolated cells to get isolated colonies grow. 
And it doesn't matter that it happens in sector three, it could happen in sector two. And if it's very dilute, it could happen in sector one. The important part is it's going to happen at one sector, and then you'll get isolated colonies. As you can see, we had two cell types initially, and we can see that the red colonies are probably pure because they don't look like they're yellow there. However, if we were to try and obtain a yellow, the cells forming the yellow colonies, we probably could not get it from any colony because each yellow colony is not isolated from the other colonies. And so what we would do would be grab from this yellow and then streak it out on another plate and then get hopefully the yellow colonies to be um, separated out as isolated colonies and then take from the colony that has uh, been derived from two colony isolation events. If we were to take the colony from this colony, most of them would be pure cultures. However, the contamination would be close to 30%. And even though that looks like a pure culture, it could have low numbers of yellow cells there. And that this may have been populated by a clump of cells and only one of them might've been yellow and the rest of the clump could have been red. So, like I said, not all of these colonies would be a pure culture. Generally, only about 70% would be a pure culture. And the other would be a colony that formed from two or more cells. Why it would not be a pure culture. And to get it to be a pure culture, you take from this cell here and streak it out again to get isolated colonies and then you take the cells from the, the colony that's gone through two colony formation events. And then the chance of it being a pure culture is very high, greater than 95%. You'll notice I'm not saying it's 100%. It will never be 100%, although you can get it very, very close if you were to continue streaking out the uh, colonies. Any question there? So get, to get pure cultures, all you need to do is get isolated colonies and send it through two colony isolation events. I should mention this procedure only works well when the colonies of interest are present in large numbers, like the red colonies are present in large numbers here. The yellow, it's actually present in a high number, but not quite high enough to even get like a 70% chance of getting a pure culture. All right. When we're talking about bacterial growth, remember this increases means it's an increase in the bacterial number, not in the cell size. Bacteria grow by three different means. Most bacteria species grow by binary fission, where one cell simply splits down the middle into two daughter cells. A few bacteria can grow by budding, where the parent cell puts out a small outgrowth that we call a bud, and the bud en enlarges at one time, the DNA will divide and move from the parent cell into the bud. And the bud will separate when the, I guess, daughter cell is almost the same size as the parent cell. There are a few bacteria species that reproduce by reproductive spores. The spores are at the tips of filaments. Let me show you. It's 
So this is usually a filamentous cell. And we're gonna draw it like that. And it will, this is the ground it's on. Not a very good ground, but you're getting the idea. There we go. The, the reproductive spores usually are in the tips of that cell. Why they're on the tip is because they're the most exposed to the wind or to a passing organism. And then that wind or the organism will take one of these reproductive spores and take it elsewhere where it will then germinate into a parent cell, which will then become its own parent cells, which could then reproduce by reproductive spores. Uh, reproductive spores are a form of reproduction because this cell has made four reproductive spores. So one cell becomes five cells, four spores and the parent cell. So one cell becomes four, five cells. That is reproduction. That is different from an endospore where one cell makes one endospore inside it, and then the parent cell dies. So when we're making a endospore, one parent cell makes one endospore, and that's not reproduction because we only had one cell to begin with, and we end with one endospore at the end. So one equals one. That's not reproduction. Any question about any of that? All right, let's go through binary fission in a little more detail. The uh, parent cell can actually elongate a little bit, and then it multiplies its DNA, and the DNA moves to different sides of the cell. The cell then begins growing a cell wall and a cell membrane in between the two DNA molecules, and that will continue and literally divide the cell into two, which can then divide into two daughter cells. Here is an actual electron microscopic picture of a cell at about that stage. That's the nucleus, or the, not the nuclear, the nuclear region, the nucleoid region, and the uh, partially formed cell wall growing in between the uh, nuclei. So most bacteria do grow by binary fission, such as E. coli, Staphylococcus epidermidis, Micrococcus luteus, any E. coli you know, probably, grows by these binary fission. A few do grow by budding, which is the normal way that yeast grow, let me show you budding. There we go. I had to do it twice for some reason. But we're going to look at the bud starting to form here. See if I can blow this up. All right, the bud is forming. And this is the DNA. It's replicating. And right there, the DNA is moving into the bud. You can sort of see it. The bud is enlarging. And now the bud separates from its parent. You can see it's separated right there. And now this bud, uh, it's going to form a bud here and a bud right there. Start to form. All right, there it's starting to form there. Any question about any of that? All right. 
Let me close that down. All right. So most bacteria grow by binary fission, but a few do grow by budding. And a few species also grow by reproductive spores. When we're talking about bacterial growth, it's helpful to use the generation time. The generation time is the time required for one cell to divide and become two. This is the same time for the population numbers to double. So from one cell into two has the same generation time for that species as the population number of that species to double. When we're talking about generation time, it's important to realize that it is the time required for a cell to divide. It is not the uh, number of cells growing per hour or something like that. And students often get this confused, probably because they're so used to speaking about uh, speed limits, miles per hour. And the generation time is the, the uh, number of generations per unit of time. Excuse me, the, it is not that. It is the number of hours per generation. The generation time varies considerably between species. It can be as fast as 20 minutes, like E. coli has a generation time of about 20 minutes. Most bacteria have a little longer generation time. Most bacteria, the generation time is one to three hours. Mycobacter, Mycobacterium leprae is the slowest, and it has a generation time of about 10 days. It has mycolic acid in its cell wall, and it takes the mycobacterium a long time to make that mycolic acid. It's a complex chemical. And uh, the mycobacterium tend to grow slower than most other bacterial families. Mycobacterium leprae is the slowest species I know in its generation time. You'll note that I said that E. coli has a generation time of 20 minutes. What we mean when we say that is that E. coli has a generation time of 20 minutes per generation. The per generation is understood. Any question about any of that? So remember the generation is a measure of the time per generation. It is not the generation per time or per hour, for example, generation per hour. Any question about any of that? All right. When we look at bacterial growth, microbiologists like to use a semi-log plot where they use a log number of the cells and then this is actually a regular arithmetic plot where they plot the uh, generations in a regular arithmetic scale. If we were to plot this on an arithmetic scale, number of cells here and the generation there, we'll note that the growth curve of the bacteria would be this, a very complex growth curve. What would you call that? I used to know that. Uh, exponential growth. The trouble with exponential growth is one cell splits into two, two into four, four into eight, eight into 16. And all of these plot, plots are right here. So the beginning plots are very tightly together and it's very hard to graph them. The other plots are fine. However, if we wanted to get the next plot on the graph, 
beyond my ceiling here. Any question about any of that? So you can't put the next plot on the graph. On the other hand, if we were to graph the generation time on a semi-logarithmic plot, the x is still in the x axis is still in the arithmetic plot. We just plot the generations. And then we plot not the number of cells, we plot the log number of cells. We get this graph here, a much simpler graph, straight line. And then the uh, one into two, two into four, four into eight, eight into 16, the plots are scattered. <clears throat> so you can actually plot them out and see them on this graph. <clears throat> Sorry, it's not shown here. And then the next plot of the graph will go about here. So you can extend this graph to put the next plot in it. And these are all reasons to use a semi-log plot. But the main reason is that this equation is much simpler to use than this equation. For this equation, you simply use y equals mx plus b. For this equation, you'd use something like y equals mx plus nx squared plus b. And there may be a plus d in there as well. Any question about any of that? So we like to plot them on a semi-log plot. When we're talking about the phases of bacterial growth, all bacteria tend to follow this bacterial growth curve. And in fact, this growth curve is found almost for all living organisms. And we know this because somebody did a study, they put deer on an island and then did the uh, growth curve of the deer on the island. And the deer followed this growth curve. Initially, there is a lag phase. The deer were transported and moved to the island and they had to get used to the island, used to being transported. And so they weren't reproducing initially. They then started exploring the island and were comfortable with it. And so they started reproducing and then they entered exponential growth. Bacteria will do the same when you grow the bacteria from a solid media. And then when we grow it in a liquid media, the bacteria enter a lag phase. In the lag phase, the bacteria are getting the enzymes they need for growing in the new media. And that takes a little bit of time once they have the enzymes they need for growing in the new media, they then enter the exponential growth phase where they grow exponentially. And the deer did that too. And then the population starts to slow. That's because there's less food available. There's less room around for either the deer or the, for the bacteria. And then waste is starting to build up. For bacteria, that would be uh, their metabolic base. That's also true for deer. You'd be waste around. And so if the deer poop on the grass, it's not going to want to eat that grass there. So the stationary phase happens where the population numbers of the population stays the same. There are a few individuals which are lucky and they're in good environments. There's some room around for them to have for their offspring to, off, to uh, occupy. Um, they are around a region where there are some nutrients for them to get. And so they're able to reproduce. However, the unlucky ones are in areas where there's lots of waste around, there aren't very many nutrients around, and they 
uh, there are lots of waste products around. So the lucky ones are reproducing and the unlucky ones are dying. The population is staying stationary because the same number that are reproducing are equal to the number that are dying. And then the population reaches a stationary phase. Stationary phase will not continue forever. Eventually, the nutrients will start being used up. The waste products will build up. And there will be less and less space. So the population will enter the death or decline phase. And that will continue until there's nothing left of the population. How long that'll take a microbe to go from a uh, lag phase to uh, the end of the death phase will depend on the species. For E. coli, that will usually take two or three weeks. But for a species that makes endospores, this could take millennia before the last cell dies. And that's because endospores can live so long. Any question about any of that? How are we doing? We got a little bit of time left. I might finish this lesson. Uh, there are different ways that we have for measuring microbial growth. There are direct methods and indirect methods. The direct methods involve the plate counts, also called the viable plate counts, the filtration method, the most probable number, direct microscopic counts, and then the indirect methods uh, involve turbidity, metabolic activity, or dry weight method. I've used all of these methods to estimate my microbial growth or the microbial growth of the population except for the most probable number. I've used all the others. The viable plate count is one of the most commonly used method for measuring microbial growth in microbiology. It measures the number of colonies that form on a plate. It takes about 24 hours or more for the colonies to form. What you simply do is uh, get these colonies to grow, count them, and then give the results as a number of colony forming units that were obtained. We call it colony number forming units because we do not know if all the colonies came from one cell, two cells, or a clump of cells. Probably some of the colonies came from a clump, some from two cells, and then the majority from a single cell. So to do a plate count, first you make a serial dilution of your original sample. You inoculate the auger plates with the different serial dilutions. Then you incubate them, allow the colonies to grow, and then you count the colonies in the plate with 25 to 250 colonies. And you use that plate to get the estimate of the number of bacteria in the original sample. There are two plate counts performed on either a poor plate or a spread plate. And essentially these set up an auger plate very similar. But what you do is you have your original sample and its bacteria numbers will be too high. So we dilute it, putting one mil into nine. So that's a one to 10 dilution, mix that up, take one mil, put it into nine more. That's the 100 dilution. There's a one 1,000 dilution, one to 10,000, and one to 100,000 dilution. Take an aliquot of each of these and uh, put it on a plate. To 
get it to grow. How you get it to grow is you can either pour a certain amount, usually one mil on the plate, and then move it about the plate, usually by just tilting and rotating the plate, up and down, back and forth, to spreading around that one mil. If you plate it with the spread plate technique, then you, uh, using a very small small volume, usually uh, one-tenth of a mil, and then you spread it around with a spreader. Both procedures, oops, put down isolated cells on the plate, which will then, after incubation, be isolated colonies. When you do a uh, viable plate count, taking each dilution, getting it to grow, many of them will have too many colonies to count. And you just abbreviate that TMTC, too many to count, or TNTC, uh, too numerous to count. And obviously that's too numerous to count, can't see any colonies. That one you can see some colonies, but there are some reasons where there's just too many to make a count of the colonies. Uh, this would be the best colony to assay because uh, the region of the cells is 25 to 250 colonies. And this one would not be the best one to count because this only has four colonies. What you want to do is base your mean on this one, not on that one. Because if you base it on that, the mean would be, let me make a new window here. If uh, use 25 to, well, just, just say 25. Then your uh, mean, let's say you have 20. Well, no, it has to be 30. Let's go 30. Colonies per plate. So I'm going to go colony forming units per plate. That mean is 30 plus Underline that. Well, you got that. Let me make that down. Oops, don't want to erase it. I can blow that up. If we just go plus or minus one, that will be one underscored. That's plus or minus. Hmm, didn't get all that to go that time. Uh, that'll be plus or minus what is that, 3.3%, something like that? Which is a pretty small number. Which is what we want. If on the other hand, we did, if we use the plate, that has three, then our mean is equal to three plus minus 
one. which is going to be not 3.3%. It's going to be plus or minus 0.3%. Now, this is a much better mean because it's 30 plus or minus 1 is plus or minus 3.3. .3. This one, 3 plus 1, is plus or minus 33%. So that's not a very good mean. So we don't want to use this plate. We want to use the plate with the good mean. Any question about any of that? All right, so that's how you do a viable plate count. It's called viable because only the cells that are viable will go on to grow a colony. The non-viable cells will not be counted by this method. The filtration method is something you use if your cells are not very numerous in number and they're very dilute. You pass the media or liquid through a filter, and then you take the filter and put it over an auger plate, and then the nutrients can diffuse from the plate to the bacteria through the filter. And then uh, you count how many colonies will grow on the filter. This is showing you a filter, a bit too many actually to uh, grow this way because you won't get isolated colonies. Uh, what they might do for this is like when they're testing the number of bacteria in the drinking water, there are bacteria in our drinking water, but it's very low. And so they would need to filter it to get their bacteria estimates. Any question about any of that? All right, the direct microscopic counts measure the volume of a liquid placed within a defined area on a gridded slide. So we're using a slide that has a specific volume. Cells are then counted microscopically. It's not good for multiple bacteria. And then both viable and live cells will be kill, uh, counted because you cannot look under the microscope and be certain whether the cell is viable or dead. A high cell concentration needs to be required, although you can centrifuge the cells to increase the concentration. There's no incubation time required. However, it is a part, pretty tedious experiment for the person who has to use his eyes to look under the microscope to do the count. So here's the gridded slide. Underneath the cover slip, there's specifically a specific volume. And usually it's set up so you have a square like this grid here, under which is on the cover slip, under the volume. And this region here, let me blow this up. This region here of the slide is exactly one microliter. Uh, this slide was designed that way. And every slide I've ever seen, it's possible they could set it on something else, but uh, they usually do it that this volume here will be one microliter. And so you can get your estimate of the cell uh, concentration, the original sample, by counting the cells, and this would be about 20, and then saying there's 20, cells per mil and then multiplying by a million because this is a uh, microliter 
for your cells in the original concentration, original sample per mil. Any question about any of that? And what you do is you just look at this slide under the microscope and then count them. So like I said, this would be about 20 cells per microliter. And uh, let's assume we just use one milliliter. Um, so we haven't diluted our sample. And then uh, 20 times 10 to the six cells per mil in the original sample is our estimate with the direct microscopic count. Any question about any of that? All right, let me go back and state you can't look at that cell and see is it viable or dead. And this method would not work if the cells are highly modal because this cell could easily move out of the square and then these cells could easily move into the square. So it's not a good method if the bacteria are fairly mobile, although you could kill these cells and then use the cell counts directly. All right, I'm not gonna talk about the most probable number, so you don't really need to know it other than that's one way to measure the microbial uh, cells. There are also indirect methods for measuring the number of cells. The first is turbidity. Now let me go and talk about all three of them. First is turbidity, the next metabolic weight, and the last dry weight. In turbidity, what you do is you get the media with your cells and then shine a light through it. Wherever there's a cell, less light will get through the media. And you compare that to the amount of light going through a tube containing the same media, but there's no organisms. This is a sterile media. No organisms in that media. So the only thing that should be blocking the light would be the media itself. Maybe a little bit of the glass tube too. And then you measure the light and compare this measurement to that measurement. It is true you have to take this measurement and look it up in a chart. But once you do in the chart, it'll tell you how many cells are present per milliliter. Of course, you have to make the chart. And what people do is they will set up a bunch of cells, usually one species, but it could be multiple species, at different density level of the cells, make the turbidity meter, and then do a second count to determine the count, like maybe a microscopic count, and then set up your chart. It is a lot of time to set up the chart. However, once you get the chart set up, you can use it forever. And this method is very easy for getting the cell count because all you have to do is get a tube of the media, a tube of the cells, put it in the spectrophotometer, and then shine light through and see how much light is getting through. Any question about any of that? All right. Metabolic activity is one of our later methods. And it looks like I'm out of time here. I think I'm over time, actually. If I've run over, you guys have to remind me, especially when I'm dizzy and not really paying close attention. All right, so we will end the lesson here. Are there any questions? If not, I'll see you at 6.30 uh, for the lab, and that's not going to give me much time. Come on.
There we go. Oh, I'm having a hard time ending this. Ah. Here we go. I don't have how to stop this. How odd. 